our next speaker is Reggie Little John. I hope that I pronounced it right. Is it Reggie or Reggie? Reggie. Reggie, okay. Reggie Little John. She's the founder and president of Women's Rights Without Frontier. Reggie Little John is the founder of uh, and president of Women's Rights Without Frontiers, an international coalition to expose and oppose forced abortion, genocide, and sexual slavery in China. She has testified five times in the United States Congress, twice at the European Parliament, and at the British and Irish Parliaments as well. She has briefed officials at the White House, the United States Department of State, and the Vatican, Ms. Little John is frequently guest on radio and television program, including CNN, C-SPAN, and the BBC, and has issued several groundbreaking reports that are included in the Congressional Report. Women's Rights Without Frontiers has the only Chinese website in the world dedicated to exposing the truth about the one-child policy. Reggie has appeared eight times on Voice of America, the official US broadcast, into China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. She is featured in the feature length documents, Cries from China about forced abortion, and It's a Girl about gender gendercide. A graduate of Yale Law School, she has represented Chinese refugees in their political asylum cases. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome Reggie Little John. His, her speech will be China's one child policy gender side and international security. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, and I appreciate being here. Um, just to let you know, uh, I have several videos that I'm going to be playing, and at least the first one has a really graphic image in it, because I'm dealing with one of the, mo the toughest subjects on the planet today, which is China's one child policy which most people do not realize is currently enforced through forced abortion, forced sterilization, and infanticide. And I've been asked to speak about this and with reference to international security issues. Now, you may have been reading recently over the last couple of weeks about a woman named Fang Zhangmei who was forcibly aborted at seven months and Actually, Women's Rights Without Frontiers broke that news to the West, and you may have seen on the internet a picture of this poor woman with her seven-month-old forcibly aborted baby next to her. Um, this photograph has sparked outrage all over China and all around the world, but I want you to know that she is not alone. And in fact, the Chinese Communist Party boasts that they have uh, prevented 400 million lives through the one-child policy. So that's more than the entire population of the United States. What I'd like to do now is start with a video um, about the one-child policy. It's called uh, China's one-child policy. Uh, Ch China, it's called Forced Abortion, China's War on Women. attorney and in the 90s I represented a client who had escaped China I represented her in her case for political asylum in the United States and she had been forcibly sterilized that was my introduction to the reality behind the one-child policy in fact China's one-child policy causes more violence against women and girls than any other official policy on earth. I call it China's war on women and girls. When I say forced abortion, I mean women are literally dragged out of their homes or off the streets. They can be jailed, in family planning jail cells, forced to abort children that they want. And this can happen all the way up to the ninth month of pregnancy. Some of these forced abortions are so violent that the women themselves die along with their full-term babies. 
One case that I'll never forget is of a young woman who was seven months pregnant without a birth permit, so that would be an illegal pregnancy, who was walking down the street and she was grabbed by family planning cadres, dragged off the street, strapped down to a table, forced to abort the baby that she very desperately wanted. And in the end, um, one of the medical personnel came to her with the body of her aborted baby and said, you need to pay for this so that we can dispose of the body. And she said she didn't have any money, so they just laid that body right next to her in the bed. And I've got a photograph of her looking down and just grieving the loss of this seven-month-old baby that was forcibly aborted. It does not matter whether you are pro-choice or pro-life on this issue. No one supports forced abortion because it's not a choice. And this violence must stop. My goal in establishing Women's Rights Without Frontiers is to end forced abortion and sexual slavery in China. And to that end, I have testified before Congress, I've addressed the European Parliament, briefed the White House. When I started this several years ago, no one was talking about the one-child policy. And now, because of the documentation that has been generated, two things have happened. Number one, the Chinese Communist Party cannot deny that the one-child policy is enforced through forced abortion, forced sterilization, and infanticide. And number two, it seems that almost everybody is talking about it at this point. It's become a household issue. Stop the violence. End China's war on women. Forced abortion is not a choice. Affecting 1.3 billion people. China's one-child policy causes more violence against women and girls than any other official policy on earth and any other official policy in the history of the world. Number one, forced abortion is violence against women. It can happen up to the ninth month of pregnancy. Sometimes the women themselves die along with their full-term babies. Number two, Women who have violated the policy are often victims of forced sterilization. These forced sterilizations are not carried out by highly trained gynecological surgeons. Uh, they are, many times, women's health is ruined through these violent procedures, which are more often than not carried out without anesthesia. Number three, a document leaked out of China in 2009 which I have called Best Practices Infanticide, is a web-based discussion among Chinese obstetricians and gynecologists about how best to kill infants who are being born alive during late-term induced labor forced abortion. Number four, because of the preference for boys, girls are disproportionately aborted, leading to something I call gendercide, the sex-selective abortion of baby girls. Um, that's not only a problem in China, but also in India. And there's a new film that's coming out called It's a Girl, which is uh, an hour-long documentary about gendercide in China and India. And I'd like to play a preview of that now.
Today, India and China eliminate more girls uh, than the number of girls born in America every year. The definition of genocide is a systematic and methodical extermination of a certain group. And the gendercide is that systematic and methodical extermination of a gender group. Why are Indian households secretly and brutally eliminating daughters from their family system? They just wet the cloth and they fold it like this and they put it on the face so the child can't breathe. Immediately the child will die. But what this is, is an entire system, a social machinery that says we don't want females. But the real problem started after I became pregnant, they started asking me for a sex determination. They wanted to know if the children are girls or boys. They started torturing me to get an abortion done. What should I do to save my daughters? He was a serial agate de Kato, who have a galebe for a Nishan for a while. He shan't money about the woman, the grown up with love. Amari the horse you would get it, let you go to the kid. His name Mark Ethery. The girl answer was saying, You send a while, what you just in a senior. 哎呀，反正他村子里都有穿高踭鞋工作的嘛，就陪他们知道我们在哪里。呃，门市呢，还得往这里过来的，白南那边几个人，别南那边我们就不来了，啊，不对不对，不对，这样子不对。我刚到那
imprisoned, tortured, denied medical treatment, uh, and then under house arrest for seven years, was released on May 21st of this year. And uh, Women's Rights Without Frontiers actually led the International Coalition to free him. I just want to show you this three-minute video about what happens to Chinese nationals when they stand up against the one-child policy. Chen Guanchen is the tank man against the one-child policy. Chen is blind and yet has taken a blind man to see the truth behind the brutal one-child policy. Chen is the one who exposed the fact that there were 130,000 forced abortions and forced sterilizations in Lin Yi County, just one county, in 2005. For that, he served a four-year, three-month jail sentence, during which time he was beaten, tortured, and denied medical treatment. He nevertheless possesses the surpassing backbone to stand up against this totalitarian regime. The Chinese Communist Party perceives this as a real threat to its crumbling legitimacy. In September of 2010, he was released from prison in an extremely weakened physical state. But he went to a larger prison, which was the prison of his own home. In fact, the entire village has become like a giant prison. What, what we're trying to do here is to get through. This man, this man has no authority. No,我们现在,我先说到的一件事情就是战胜恐惧,来揭露他们这种没有人道,没有基本良知的一系列的见不得人的行为。after the release of this video to the West, he and his wife were beaten senseless and left on their beds, unable to go to the hospital. Join in the fight to free Chen Guan Chen. Sign the petition. Send a message to the Chinese Communist Party that Chen Guanchen and his wife must be freed immediately. And send a message to Chen Guanchen and his family. Chen, we want you to know you are not forgotten. We are fighting for you and we will not stop until you are free. Well, when, when Chen Guanchen arrived in New York City, um, you can imagine, it was one of the most exciting moments of my entire life. And not only that, but I was able to meet with him and his family recently in Greenwich Village. And I showed them this video, which was the video around which so much of the uh, movement uh, just was formed. I was working directly with people inside of China. And one of them said that every time she wanted to inspire people to take action for Chen Guanchen, she would uh, tweet the, the Chinese version of this video. But the fact remains that if somebody in China wants to stand up against the one-child policy, this is what happens to them. So really, it's up to the international community to do something about it. The one-child policy is causing a slow-motion demographic disaster. Not only is there this 
terrible gender imbalance, but China does not have enough young people to support its aging population. Why then does China continue this policy? I believe that China's one-child policy is keeping the regime in place. It is social control masquerading as population control. The Chinese Communist Party wields forced abortion as an instrument of terror to keep its people down. The infrastructure of population control co coercion can be turned in any direction to crush dissent. The system of paid informants to identify illegally pregnant women tears at the relationships in Chinese society. If you can't trust anyone, you can't organize for democracy. Now, this is an issue that is ripe for the exercise of cultural diplomacy, defined as the exchange of ideas, values, beliefs, and other aspects of culture with the intention of fostering mutual understanding. I think that mutual understanding is a good beginning, but I don't think it's sufficient. If you try to create mutual understanding, for example, with the Chinese Communist Party, they'll just say, well, our population control program is appropriate for our nation. Mind your own business. Okay? But actually, I think that some things are just wrong. Forced abortion is one, and gendercide is another. Thank you. <laughs> now, I, thank you. I, I understand that we're um, late for lunch. I'm, we're running about five minutes late. So, um, Instead of taking questions, why don't we break for lunch? And uh, or do you want me to take a question? You. We would have a few minutes. It's it's your lunch break, so it's up to you. So maybe we'll take one or two questions now, and then if you have a few minutes during the lunch break, if others would like to approach kind of one on one. But I think it's okay. So why don't we take a few questions okay. first? Go ahead. Ladies first, and then we'll go to the back. Thank you very much for. Thank you very much for the presentation. I am um, Anna from European Peace University in Austria, origin from Cameroon. I don't really want to express my feeling about the video, but I am happy for the initiative. I, my question is, as an advocate, since when you started this, how much have you achieved? Has some of the um, policies concerning this change in the China constitution, or how is it going? Okay, so the question is, how long have I been doing this, and, and have my efforts had any impact, and have the policies changed? Uh, with respect to the policies changing, the answer is generally no. Now, there have been some tweaking around the edges. For example, a couple years ago, they decided that if both parents are themselves only children, that in Shanghai, uh, people can have a second child. And I think that they may have expanded that somewhat. And so then the word goes out in the rest West Western media, China relaxes the one-child policy. That's not true. You have to really watch out for that because if they just do the slightest thing, it gets announced as having been relaxed. The issue with the one-child policy is not whether the government allows a woman to have one child or two children. It's, it's the government telling people how many kids they can have, number one, and then number two, enforcing that limitation coercively, and that has not ended. We've, I have three cases of forced abortion in the last six weeks, and, and, and it's not just that there are three cases, it's that there are three cases that made it out to the West. That's the challenge. It's not that this isn't happening all over the place. It is. It's just that people take such risks in, in breaking the news to the West. For example, this woman, Fang Zhang Mei, her family is under terrible persecution. She's the one who had this forced abortion at seven months recently, whose picture was out all over the internet. Well, the news came out today that um, her husband has disappeared. Now they, he's called the family and said that he's safe, but apparently the local officials have organized protests in front of their home, and people are carrying big red banners in front of their homes saying, you know, leave traitors, et cetera. Um, Fang Zheng Mei herself is still in the... In, in the hospital, she feels that she's in a prison. So this is what happens when you allow your photograph to be taken and put up on the, on the internet. Not everybody is willing to do that. Now, in terms of how long I've been doing this and what, what things we have accomplished, I'm an attorney and I'm actually a complex commercial and intellectual property litigator. I'm not, but I did represent Chinese refugees for their cases uh, for asylum in the mid 90s and my first uh, my first client was forcibly sterilized. So my 
attention has been focused on this since the mid-90s. What have we accomplished? When I started doing this full-time in 2008, there was a complete level of ignorance about this issue, and it was getting no play in the media. In 2009, you saw that story about the poor woman who was forcibly aborted at seven months, and they laid the ba body of her baby next to her in the bed. I broke that story to the West. That, that is in a congressional report together with the other woman that you saw who died in a forced abortion at nine months. No one picked it up. It was not in the mainstream media. And yet when Women's Rights Without Frontiers broke a very similar case of Fang Zhang Mei two weeks ago, it's everywhere. New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times. I'm being um, interviewed on the BBC about it tonight. Why is that? It's because for four years, day and night, day and night, day and night, we've been pressing this issue to the point where it's finally made it into the public consciousness internationally. Thank you so much, Madam Reggie, for your presentation. <laughs> My name is Basma Tribi, and I've been uh, working, I'm from Egypt, and I've worked on women development projects back home. Um, the, the, the topic that you're talking about discussing, it's, it's limited to China with regards to specific policy. Right. But back home, FGM, it's like widely uh, executed. And the campaigns against it are being persecuted by being Western-oriented. So I, I think that you could relate to this, such an idea with regards to the example that you were mentioning earlier, being a traitor, the Chinese woman being portrayed as like, you're a traitor, you should leave the village, and so on and forth. But my perception is that it's, it, it gets much more difficult to portray such an idea with regards to any connections to the outside world. Th so you need to have this grassroots awareness rather than just media portraying the, um, the hardships of women from the outside perspective of things. And I think this is way much harder coming from the Middle East and again, um, uh, where women are not fairly treated, especially in the rural areas. Right, so, so what you're saying you is that it's very difficult because if, if a Westerner is the one who's bringing the attention to this, then they're open to the criticism that stopping this is a, is a Western idea. And um, we would love to see a grassroots movement take hold inside of China, but I've just talked about what the consequences are. It's, it's, we're in a real catch-22 there. Sure, it would be great if the Chinese people themselves could rise up on this, um, but the consequences are severe for people who do. And um, it's interesting because... I've been on Voice of America, I, I just counted, I think 10 times now. And Voice of America is the uh, official Ch American broadcast into restrictive nations, inc including China. And I have been talking exclusively about the one child policy and about Chen Guanchen. And um, actually, it seems that people really appreciate me as a Westerner. As th they feel like because they can't raise their voices abroad or, at home domestically, that at least somebody is doing it internationally, and it's having an impact. It is having an impact. Women's Rights Without Frontiers is starting a domestic effort, which is, um, we're about to launch on our website the ability of people to, you know, give money to directly support women who are um, pregnant with girls, so that, for example, I'm supporting a woman right now who recently gave birth to a girl. Her husband and her mother-in-law have been really pressuring her to expose the girl meaning just leave her out in the field to die. And because she's getting not very much money, but just enough money from me, she's able to fight back saying, look, this girl is bringing, uh, is bringing money into the family. And right now, that girl is alive. There's another woman that, that we're supporting um, who is fleeing a forced abortion. So she's hiding, going from village to village to village. And we're just giving her enough money to just try to help, help her survive. So these are domestic efforts. And all I can say is that since the international movement has gone from basically nothing in 2008 to like a major outcry in 2012, we're hoping to see the same thing happen domestically in China and that that policy will end.